usual starting place of the expedition in Africa is the little village of Arkeza. It is in equatorial heat on the mud flats of the Niger River, and we are already over 10,000 miles away from home. Adventurous missionaries, ivory traders, and elephant hunters have used this town as a jumping off place many times before us, and signs of civilization are apparent. Life is not a game of bridge and an afternoon of tea for the ladies of Africa. They are too busy pounding rice for the next meal. Yet there are light spots in this dark land. Here is a beauty parlor. She doesn't put in permanent waves. <laughs> she's paid for trying to take them out. Anyway, she's trying to take out something. And here is the original tailor of two suits for the price of one thing. While he weaves a pair of trousers on his ancient foot power loom, his customer <laughs> in the background waits in his other suit. This little group of elephant tusks is worth over $10,000, and each pair represents the death of a four-ton animal. Here we charter an old-time wood-burning stern wheeler which will carry the expedition approximately 500 miles up the Niger River. From that point, we will travel by truck, and the foot safari will carry the supplies. Hundreds of gallons of gasoline and oil for the truck must be transported and deposited at convenient points along our proposed route. In this manner, or on the backs of our native quarters. We engage most of the town's population at 25 cents a day to chop wood for the boat and gather drift logs from along the river banks in their primitive canoes, which are hollowed out of a single tree. The foot safari of 200 natives are chosen from various tribes, and the immense amount of necessary supplies are divided into small loads, which they can carry on their backs far in advance of the truck and sound equipment. The fact that each tribe speaks a different language lessens the possibility of them all striking or quitting the expedition at one time. How would you like to carry 60 pounds on your head 20 miles a day in torturous heat? Finally, the entire expedition is loaded onto the steamship which will carry us up to Niger and into the heart of the dark continent. Then we will begin our great trek across equatorial Africa, where man is the prey of animals and animals the prey of man, Africa the unknown. The crossing of the Shari River presented a problem until we found a trader with a small portable motor attached to a rowboat. Our own men fashioned a flimsy raft of three dugout canoes, which didn't look very safe, but was better than nothing at all. So we put the truck on and took the chance of walking back if anything happened in midstream. Goodbye, everybody. However, many trips landed everything safely. And on the other side, we met some lonesome Frenchmen who treated us to wine and a very fine dinner. They were surprised to find that we had come all the way from the west coast by motor. At last, we arrive on the edge of the great Ituri forest in which elephants, the largest of all animals, and pygmies, the smallest of men, are found. The trail of the elephant is easy to follow, for they trample down everything in their way. Larger in size, but comparable in bulk to the rhino, elephants differ greatly in brains. They are the wise, are the most stupid. Their sight is very bad, but their scent and hearing are highly developed, making them most dangerous animals to approach. like this are very loyal comrades. They have been known to carry a wounded pal away from danger, supporting his immense body between them at the risk of their own lives. The African elephant, unlike his Indian namesake, has never been successfully trained for the use of man. 
Until recent years, ivory hunters penetrated the haunts of the elephant for centuries, killing millions of these majestic mammoths and taking away nothing but their tusks. We had been unable to find a route through the dense forest to the pygmy village, so we seized this opportunity to bribe our way with salt, which necessity of life is very difficult for them to obtain. Boy! Kuja Hapa! Kuja! Kuja Hapa! Here you are. They love it. Like a child loves candy. It's very scarce in the forest. Chumbi! Chumbi Mingi! Kuja! Chumbi Guinea? Ife Minera? Yo! Dito! He says he'll take us to the pygmy clearing if we bring plenty of salt. We better bring plenty of water. Something tells me he's going to be plenty thirsty. Finally, our little guide brought us to a clearing in the center of the deep Ituri forest, and hundreds of pygmies came from all directions to greet us. The average height is a little over four feet and they rarely weigh more than 75 pounds. But they are well proportioned and comparatively strong. This is the smallest tribe of people in the world. They live in clans of 20 or 30, a few miles apart, and a representative of each family receives the salt. leaders are in turn ruled by a great king who occupies his throne through blood succession, just like the crowned heads of Europe. He is honoring us by coming in from the depths of his forest capital. We wanted to pay our respects to his majesty there, but the darkness in the interior makes photography impossible, and the king graciously offered to come to us in the clearing. He is comparatively young, and both he and his subjects show character and intelligence. In this, they differ from most of the other African tribes. Besides supplying music for the dance, these great tom-toms boom out messages in a code similar to our telegraphy. <laughs> Everybody dances in pygmy land, and their chanting, while not particularly harmonious, has a fast rhythm that makes the feet want to do things. These are the original hot dogs. The pygmies have practiced companionate marriage for centuries, long before Judge Lindsay was ever heard of. If a marriage doesn't take after a year's tryout, they start all over again with a new wife. No one is allowed more than one wife at a time, except the king. He gets two for safety's sake, to ensure a son and future king. These are the queens. They are very modest and shy <laughs> when the king is around. According to scientists who have made a study of the past history of this race, the pygmy is not really a Negro. And their faces certainly show a great similarity to nearly every other nationality in the world. Less than 2,000 of this particular tribe are known to exist. And until our visit, no one ever knew the proper tribal name, which is Ifi, I-F-I, Ifi. Here is an unusual fact. This peculiar style of wrestling is exactly the same as a very popular sport in Japan called rice wrestling. And here we find it in the center of Africa, 10,000 miles away. The idea of the thing is, the first one who is thrown off his feet is the loser. They make everything that they use, and the jungle furnishes them with food. Here they are constructing arrows. The shafts are made from the hearts of palm trees, which are strong, light, and durable. Look at these beautiful teeth. A dentist in Africa would have a great chance. 
to starve to death, they mine and smelt their own iron, which they mold into arrowheads. The big savage in the center is the official poison mixer for the whole tribe. He actually stands only five feet, ten inches, but the difference in height is so noticeable that he looks like a giant beside them. This man belongs to another tribe and is maintained by the pygmies for one purpose. He mixes the poison. Then they dip their arrows into it and put the blame on him for whatever they kill. Their own conscience is clear because the force of the arrow will not cause death, but the poison does. That's their way of escaping responsibility. <laughs> Darn clever, these pygmies. The large mound with the little house on it in the background is a great ant hill. This is where we lived while here. They shoot very accurately, but depend more on the poison than the force. Pulled by their fat tummies. it is very hard to get close enough to photograph them. Any unusual noise on the sounds of every description. A cheetah slinks off, uttering his odd bird-like call. Unusual and rare baby bat-eared foxes run for their dugout, where they huddle close together and cry plaintively in fear for their lives. Even a herd of ostriches glide by. The huge pads on their feet muffle the sound, and they make great speed in their springy, strutting manner. It's like Mother Nature holds a grudge against the zebra. Its glaring stripes make it an outstanding target for beasts of prey in search of food. Almost powerless when attacked by a lion, but oh boy, they kick and bite viciously when bothered by other animals. Zebras in zoos over here rarely make any kind of a sound, but this shrill bark is common both day and night in Africa. The stripe patterns are like human fingerprints. No two are found alike. They are often found grazing in company with a herd of topi, which are similar to a large American deer. These two widely separated species often fight together against their common enemy, the lion. The ripples across the picture in the background are heat waves, for it is 130 in the shade, and we never found much of that. Not the least bit camera conscious, just the born actor. <laughs> His relations are running out on him. I don't know whether he's calling his mother or his father, but I guess he wants his mama. Though lions kill hundreds of thousands for food each year, the zebra still survives and increases in number, and their pounding hoofs in mad stampede can be heard on all the belts of Africa. The original rubberneck. You can't get close to a giraffe without him seeing you. But their curiosity is stronger than their fear. And often they'll stand a hundred yards away and gaze steadily down at you. They are natural born reachers. They will drink every day if near water, but they can get along without it for weeks at a time, thereby making a monkey out of the camel. A full-grown giraffe is the tallest animal on the face of the earth, often standing nearly 16 feet high. Hunters rarely kill these harmless monsters, but the natives often do, for the hide makes a bullwhip 30 feet long without a break.
But these two lions are stuck with food and lazy. They're just looking for a shady place to snooze. But Mr. Giraffe doesn't trust them. He just remembers a very important business engagement elsewhere. For such awkward bodies, they can make great speed, sometimes traveling as fast as 40 miles an hour. Our microphone registers only the hoofbeats. For giraffes, having no vocal cords, cannot utter a sound. They're just naturally dumb. But not quite as dumb as the yokel who first saw one in a circus and said, there ain't no such animal. Here is a marvelous chance to study their peculiar rocking horse gallop. All four feet are never off the ground at one time. They were once called camel leopards, due to their leopard spots and their unusual ability to go without water. The huge legs, long neck, and sloping back make the giraffe appear clumsy. But notice how the head remains level, while the neck takes up the bumps like a shock absorber. They could run clear across the picture with a glass of water between their horns and not spill a drop. Once on the way, these great runners are hard to stop, and they have often hung themselves on the telegraph wires of the new railroad, which has been started from the Indian Ocean coast. The little youngsters keep up with the old folks. Even leading at time, here is a sure enough neck and neck race, <laughs> with the little fellow trying to hitch on behind. <laughs> if he only had sense, he'd grab that tail. Flamingos by the million. Each bird stands nearly four feet high and weighs about 30 pounds, but the flesh is odorous and unfit to eat. <laughs> it looks like the parade of the wooden soldiers. <laughs> they appear to be floating, but in reality they are... It is an amazing sight to watch a flock numbering hundreds of thousands suddenly lift themselves into the air, so thick that they hide the sun. Thick is the reality of an artist's dream. A golden sun fades to a lovely pink in natural harmony with the color of the flamingo that wing their way in vivid circles, but always within sight of the lake, which is their home in life and their grave in death. Watch the fish trying to gain the upper water so they can spawn in the place where they were born. Oh, how would you like to have that baby on your hook? Fifty miles below the falls, the Nile spreads out into a flat, virgin wooded valley. Unusual trees such as this dot the shores, and in the interior, a short distance, are almost impassable papyrus swamps. It is here that the famous Tetsi fly, which causes sleeping sickness, breeds, and the far-famed white rhinoceros makes his home. Here he is, the square-lipped, or so-called white rhino. He is much larger than the common black variety, and less than 200 are known to exist. Gosh, that's a big one. What do you think he weighs? Oh, about three times. Gee, all bulk and no brains. <laughs> Charming fellow, he'd like to make friends with you, in his own way. Thick-skinned and bad-tempered, this most weird survivor of prehistoric animals is rapidly becoming extinct. The horns are not bones, but consist of thickly compressed hair which is valued at three times the price of ivory because it is shipped to China, where it is considered the greatest of all medicine cure-all. I am P-A-L-L-A, -L -L -A, Impala, the most graceful of all the antelope family. They always travel in herds of a hundred or more through a park-like country. I'll make them show some action. 
Be careful. Don't hit them. I won't. When frightened, they jump, much like a kangaroo, but infinitely more graceful. The natives call this the dance of the impala, but we call it the dance of the leaping lemurs. Look at that baby jump. If you notice, folks, the one without a hat is a distant relative to the Mexican jumping beam. No authority seems to know why the impalas jump. It's just another of those unexplainable mysteries of African animal life. When they stop, no amount of outside interference can stop them again. Sometimes they jump backwards to keep the dust out of their eyes. They almost seem to have wings as they literally glide through space. Their lithe bodies sail through the air for as much as 40 feet in a single jump and 12 to 15 feet high, but sometimes higher in the spring. They jump higher on their mother's side than they do on their father's side. Here's a great job for a cowboy, <laughs> breaking in one of these things. It's probably something they ate last night. There goes three of them up together. Lions eat very few impalas because the impalas keep him on the jump and the lion goes crazy trying to catch up. like a buffalo. They act like a cow and make a noise like a lion. All of which means that something went wrong somewhere. With their shaggy manes and heavy forequarters, they remind one of the American buffalo, but only at a distance, for they are much smaller. They always roam through fairly open country in great herds, and when the sun is in back of them, their white beards make them visible for miles. Though they have a placid cow-like expression, they will charge without no and fight together have been known to kill a lion. Dozens of them huddle under one small tree to escape the terrific heat, for she is scarce. Though there are many hardships connected with an expedition of this kind, the charm of Africa lies in the ever-changing things of interest. You never know what to expect just around the corner. Paul! What is it? Look at those big grasshoppers. Grasshoppers nothing. Those are Abyssinian locusts. The whole belt will soon be black with them. We'll have to cover everything up. Come on! Go and get that camera, quick. Charlie? You have to cover that truck with the cameras and tie it down tight. All right. Yango! Come on, Yango. Right, Hurry up. Get a hold of that crap, quick. Come on, pull it right down. Come on with that camera. I'll help them on the truck. Get over there. Get this rope. Four arms there, Mickey. Hurry up. You got it? Tomorrow I will bring locusts unto thy coast, and they shall eat every tree which groweth for you out of the field. This tremendous swarm is just such a visitation of locusts as Moses called down to punish the wicked pharaoh of Egypt 3,500 years ago. They'll be on us in a minute. Let's photograph them from the inside. Oh. The windows of the tent were especially constructed of flexible isinglass, through which photography is possible. Swarms such as this have been known to be 50 miles in width and 100 miles long, and often they'll fly several hundred miles in a day. 
They strike terror into the hearts of man and beast. And natives in a stricken territory watch with feverish anxiety as the creatures fly overhead, praying that they will continue their flight without alighting to devour their crops and ruin their food supply. They hit the tent like hailstones. Are the boys safe? Yes, I put them in the cab of the truck. Like an enormous storm of black flakes, they cover the earth in a ravenous horde, eating every bit of grass in their path. Every animal leaves the stricken area, and hundreds die in their frantic efforts to shake off the pests. Clouds of countless billions literally hide the sun, and every modern resource of science has failed to combat them, for no one knows from whence they came or where they go. Hand of a higher power, the wildebeest know by instinct that the only way to escape disaster is by taking a course at right angles to the wind because the locusts fly with the wind. It is estimated that there are about 60,000 locusts to the square yard, and a swarm such as this covers millions and millions of square yards. Unlike the Bible plague of old, the present plague is no respecter of race, creed, or country. The stampeding wildebeests raise clouds of giant hoppers, which have settled on the ground. The frantic animals must travel more than 50 miles to sex storm before they can eat or drink again. In the evening, they continue to come down from the sky in millions, settling on every bit of green vegetation in the countryside. They break strong branches of trees by the sheer weight of their countless numbers, and the ground is covered with a blanket at least six inches deep. All through the night they eat, eat, eat every blade of grass, every leaf of the trees, and in the morning this beautiful country is transformed into a bleak and barren desert. To our knowledge, we are the first in the history of motion pictures to record and photograph this phenomenon of nature. And Moses said, for they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and they did eat of every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees, and there remained not any green thing, either tree or herb of the field, through all the land. With their crops and food supply ruined overnight, whole tribes of natives have been caught in a scourge like this to die of starvation before they can get out of the devastated area. It was our good fortune that the truck contained sufficient food to carry us out of this ravaged country to our next supply station. After many days of travel in equatorial heat, we climbed to the summit of the Banagi Mountains. Below is the Tanganyika Valley of Lions, and here among the tribe of Maasai, the most profound tragedy of the entire trip took place. And here in the shelter of a great rock, the Maasai build their Minyata, or thorn enclosed village, which houses the old men, women, and children of this famous cattle raising tribe. This Minyata is completely surrounded by an eight foot wall of thorn bushes, with the cow dung huts of the natives just inside the thorny circle. This peculiar construction is a protection against night prowling lions. In the evening, the entrance gate is also plugged with the thorn bushes and the cattle are herded into the center, where they are comparatively safe through the night of marauding lions in search of food. The whole assembly is only a temporary city, for when the grass is gone from the nearby fields, the entire tribe moves to a new location. A Maasai prizes his cattle rather more than his wives, and he has about the same number head of each. Both are traded in regularly, and the prices vary according to the supply and demand. 
The old chief told us the average price per maiden is one steer, two cows, and a keg of honey beer. Of course, second-hand wives are quoted at cut-rate prices. He said he was a good trader and trotted out his collection of female curios to prove it. It is the duty of the Maasai women to take good care of the calves as well as the children, and the chief apologized for those of his wives who were out helping the cows. The rest of them wouldn't come out. Some of the others were nursing calves, for this duty is just as important as the care of the children. Copper and iron wire form the principal adornments of the Maasai women, and their social standing is graded by the amount possessed. Some of the favorites can hardly lift their arms because of the weight of the many metal rings for which the fond husband has traded his precious cattle. The cattle spend the night in the circle of thorns, and at daybreak they are turned loose to graze on the plain. No Maasai ever eats meat. They live entirely on an atrocious curd made from milk and blood, both of which are drawn from the cows. Even in times of starvation and drought, they die by hundreds rather than eat the meat of the cattle, which they persist in treating as ornaments. They are slightly smaller than our cattle, and each has a peculiar hump on the back like that of a camel. While his youngest son attended to the cattle, the kind old chief instructed his oldest boy, Kega, to show us around and help however he could in our purpose to secure close-up scenes of wild lions. Though thousands of lions are known to be in this grassy valley, they have learned to stay away from the cattle because a human being is always with them. Dotting the hillsides in the open, but close to the Maasai village, can be seen the huts of the Maasai El Moran or lion hunters, the most courageous and feared of all African warriors. They are the tribe policemen or protectors. And in these clusters of small huts, they live like knights of old, being carried their food of milk and blood by maidens of the tribe, who also live with them in a state of free love. They are maintained for the sole purpose of hunting lions, which have become man-eaters or molesters of the great herds of cattle that constitute the wealth of the tribe. Here in this valley of lions, we make a permanent camp and carefully prepare to obtain motion pictures and sound of the giant cats in their natural moods. You know, this reminds me of a duck flying back home. That's practically what it is, except that we're hiding a camera instead of a gun. Kager, our Maasai boy, had chosen the location of our boma or thorn bush protection near a stone salt lick where a group of lions were in the habit of coming. On his ant hill throne he scans his realm, always in search of an unwary wildebeest, zebra or warthog, which will afford a target for his hunting skill or satisfy his enormous appetite. They prefer zebra meat to any, and kills like this are to be seen nearly every day. Next to the zebra, harmless gazelles make easy prey for even the smallest of the killers. A hungry lion will stalk and kill any animal it sees, and there are few with the exception of the rhino and elephant, which are comparatively safe. Truly the king of beasts, flesh-eating and blood-drinking, but now a picture for an artist's eye. Though she appears as gentle as a tabby cat, the female is more deadly than the male. Look, she sees us. It's quiet. Look out. Here is a remarkable photograph. Two lions have made a wildebeest kill. And the herd can be seen in the background, even before they had a chance to get away. 
Even at that, some of the best pictures escape our camera. For instance, we saw this great female leap clean over the hedge in the background, carrying a 200-pound gazelle in her teeth. Lions are not supposed to be able to climb trees. <laughs> but how would you like to be where the meat is? The heat at all times is almost unbearable to both man and beast. In the middle of the day, when the sun is white hot, they huddle under scraggly trees for what little shade there is. Lions are rarely found in large numbers, and it is quite unusual to photograph seven at one time. At three months of age, the cubs cry for meat, and mother must provide. For these have not yet reached the age when they can make a kill of their own. While we were in the boma, the lions inspected our truck, even attempting a small attack on this unusual stranger. They tore off a spare tire and slyly took a little nibble at it. They seem much surprised when it doesn't bite back. There is a widespread belief that lions live in the jungle. So the truth is just the opposite. They are always found in open grassy plains. Because the lion is a meat eater and he feeds entirely on animals which in turn live off the virgin grass of the open country. She carries this 200 pounds of dead weight like a house cat would a mouse. But lions never tease a victim. They break the neck instantly with a tremendous swipe of the paw and eat what they want almost immediately. Others have caught the scent of the kill and come in uninvited to attend the banquet. Shooting the prowlers of the plains with a camera is much more difficult than with a gun and brings one in closer contact with them. There are no place cards at this feast, but despite their noticeable lack of manners, it is a remarkable fact that they seldom quarrel over a kill, but share it amicably. So great is a lion's appetite that he must make a kill every two days in order to exist. The thousands of lions in this section kill hundreds of thousands of animals each year for food alone. In their natural state, active lions are seldom found with great shaggy manes, like those in a zoo, because the long hair is caught on bushes and torn by the thorn trees. Trigger! Get rifles from motor car, quick! Charlie! 
The bomber! Quick! One big male even followed us toward the bomber. It is very interesting to watch a lion shy at the sight of thorn bushes when he will charge straight at a firing revolver. After reloading our revolvers, it was useless to continue the battle because it was already too late to do anything for poor Kaga. Handicapped as we were, with the rifles in the truck, we were forced to wait the rest of the afternoon for the lions to leave. Finally, five out of the six which were around us trooped off behind the leader. Only one of the man-eaters reigned at the kill. A away, a flock of vultures awaited his departure. And behind them, in the distance, a ring of cowardly hyenas also await turn. Tough to tell the poor old chief about Kega. Come on, let's go. The Code the Savage, Eighth for a Life. The Council of the Elders are meeting to decide which of the younger warriors shall be sent out after the last. They have long been accustomed to kill with the spear. Lions which man-eaters on the cattle. Ah. This sadly a welcome of the council. Many of Kager's older kin now past their would be willing the young warriors in the hunt. But have already been sent to the huts of the El Moran, lion hunters. For this honor is served solely for them. The fence made of ostrich feathers and is as necessary to hunt as the spear. The Maasai El Moran love a battle, but not all of them are out to go on the hunt. Great honor, and the chief only take along those chosen by the council. Most of the younger warriors wear headdresses made from the manes of the lion they have killed. All their lives they have lived foods, blood, milk, and water, and they are as fit as lions they hunt, cruel and fearless. They let us come along to photograph the hunt, only on our solemn bus, not to shoot the lion. Faces, legs, and chest painted red, yellow, and white, with a substance made from the ashes of previously lions. Naked or half naked, with girdles of leopard skin, buffalo hide shield colored with bold patterns, carrying a long bladed spear. For now, master of the west, the terror that stalks by night, this grim lord of slaughter, his doom at the hands of the only foe to him. This is the challenge. <laughs> They in unison, the sun, and own fierce singing builds up a furious wrath at the man. Messiah warriors have advanced across the rolling grassy plains in long lines. 
speeding across a circle 12 miles in diameter, lies panthers, their great muscles rippling under their smooth dark skin. Suddenly, a short distance ahead, a great female spied us and darted off to the right. We were to shoot her, but we could not break our promise with the Maasai chieftain. Now the hunters divide form the final circle around us. The razor sharp spearhead bent like silver in the sun rays, and their savage yells become shrill in anticipation of victory. The lioness takes temporary refuge in a creed. And now we see that there are two of them, but it is too late to inform the Messiah. In small groups, the spearmen come closer and gradually form the ring of death. One by one, they take their ring, and each, when he is near enough, crouches behind his shield. Spear in hand, his eager face gleaming over the rim. Shields held steady to body, and quivering spears poised for instant action, the men in front brace themselves for the shock of the rushing charge. The lioness watches them closely, unraised, and seemingly withholding her charge until they are ready. At last, the tense ring is complete. It is a wild sight, the ring of spearmen intent, silent, bent on blood, and in center, a great man-killing beast. This ring, once formed, must not be broken, for the man who steps back in the face of a charge is forever branded a coward. Finally, with a tremendous roar, she charges. The crowded moment begins. The leader plunges his beast. Right now, he's down. His shield protects him. He's up again. Not a man back. Sudden spears drive clear to the ferocious beast. Look out! There's another! It's the male, fighting to protect his own. over their victory, for the lion is symbol to them of everything great, and they worship his power with deep respect. Finally, the end of this day of thrills is the Messiah tribute to their fallen foe. Reverently, they move the carts of the lion sit on another spot than that on which it died. <laughs> 